Awesome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Roots Week 2020, the fierce urgency of now. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started, uh, let's have our language justice partners, Bancha Linguas, walk us through our language access. Saludos y bienvenidos a eh, Roots 2020, la feroz urgencia de la hora. Gracias por unirse con nosotros. Antes de comenzar, eh, vamos a invitar a nuestro grupo o nuestro colaborador, Bancha eh, Lengua, a hablar sobre la interpretación. Saludos. Mi nombre es Lila y mis pronombres son ella y ella. Y estoy aquí con mi compa y cointérprete María Luisa. Sus pronombres son ella. Somos miembros del colectivo de justicia del lenguaje Bancha Lenguas basado en Bull Bancha, Luisiana. Greetings. My name is Lila. My pronouns are she and they. I'm joined today by my comrade and co-interpreter, María Luisa, whose pronouns are she. We're members of Bancha Lenguas Language Justice Collective based in Bull Bancha, Luisiana. Pulbancha es la palabra Choctaw que significa la tierra donde se habla muchos lenguajes. Pulbancha is the Choctaw word which means the land where many languages are spoken. Como trabajadores de justicia del lenguaje, nos esforzamos a crear espacio para que todos aquí presentes puedan entender y ser entendidos en el idioma en que nos sentimos más poderosos. As language justice workers, we strive to create space for everyone here to understand and be understood in the language in which we feel most powerful. Please speak at a slow and steady space, pace. If you are speaking too fast, you will see us make this hand signal, which means to slow down, and we invite you to do this as well. Thank you. It may be hard to see us on your screen, so we ask that you please keep an eye on the chat we send a message asking you, and we may send a message asking you to slow down. Para este espacio, por favor, hable a un paso lento y constante. Si estás hablando muy rápido, nos verás hacer esta señal de manos que significa ir más despacio. Invitamos a que lo hagan también. Gracias. Es posible que sea difícil vernos en tu pantalla, así que pedimos que le echen un vistazo al chat. Eh, por si pedimos que demandemos un mensaje para que vaya más despacio. Speak lowly, uh, loudly and clearly. If you have, have, have headphones with a mic, please use them. We will make this hand signal if we can't hear you and you're all invited to do the same. We will send a message to the chat. Habla en voz alta y clara. Habla en voz alta y clara. Si tienes audífonos, eh, con micrófono, utilízalos. Haremos esta señal con la mano si no podemos escucharte. Están todos invitados a hacer lo mismo. También enviaremos un mensaje al chat. Keep your mic on mute when, we're, uh, when you are not speaking. Mantén tu micrófono en mudo si no estás hablando. And one speaker at a time. Interpreters can only interpret one voice at a time, and we don't ever want to be in a position of having to decide which voice to privilege over another. Una persona a la vez, los intérpretes solamente pueden interpretar una voz a la vez y nunca queremos estar en la posición de tener que decidir cuál voz privilegiar sobre otra. Y ahora, vamos a encender la plataforma para la interpretación. And now, we will turn on the interpretation platform. Wendy, if you could um, turn on the feature for us. Si estás usando una computadora, vas a ver un icono de globo al pie de tu pantalla con la palabra interpretación. Haz clic sobre él y selecciona el canal de tu lenguaje preferido, inglés o español. If you're using a computer, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen with the word interpretation. Click on it and select the channel with the language of your choice, English or Spanish. Si están usando un teléfono inteligente o una tableta, busca tres puntos que lean más. Haz clic y te aparecerá una lista. Haz clic sobre interpretación, selecciona inglés o español y luego haces clic sobre finalizar. 
If you're using a smartphone or a tablet, look for three dots that read more. Click on it and it will prompt a list. Click on interpretation, select English or Spanish, then click done. Todes, cuando hagan su selección, verán una opción para silenciar audio original y que le permite escuchar solo la voz del intérprete. Si deseas escuchar el audio original en un volumen más bajo en el trasfondo, puedes quitarlo del modo en silencio. Y puedes agregar en cualquier momento o puedes regresar en cualquier momento para cambiar tu selección. Everyone, when you make your selection, you will see an option to mute original audio, which allows you to hear only the voice of the interpreter. If you'd like to hear the original audio at a lower volume in the background, you may leave it unmuted. And you can go back at any moment to change your selection. Y es posible que sea difícil vernos en tu pantalla. So, así que le pedimos que le echen un ojo al chat por si enviamos un mensaje pidiendo que vayas más despacio. And again, it may be hard for, for you to see us on your screen, so we ask that you please keep an eye on the chat in case we send a message asking you to slow down. Now, Wendy, would you um, assign one of our interpreters, Maria Luisa, to the uh, channel? Now, let's try this out together. Click on the button that says Spanish, everyone on the Zoom line. This will take you to the Spanish channel. And in a sec, you will hear my co-interpreter, Maria Luisa, interpreting into Spanish. If you can't hear my co-interpreter in the Spanish channel, we invite you to send a message via chat box. Y esto es muy importante. Solamente las personas que entienden español e inglés pueden permanecer en la línea sin interpretación. Si eres bilingüe en español e inglés, siéntate libre de cambiar de idioma cuando estás hablando. Solo pedimos que no cambies de idioma en medio de una oración. Y recuerda, no sufres en silencio. Si hay algún problema con la interpretación, por favor déjanos saber en el chat o envía un mensaje a los anfitriones. Crear un espacio bilingüe virtual es una experiencia nueva y requiere paciencia para ir más lentamente para así poder terminar juntos. Gracias al equipo de Alternate Roots que hizo esto posible y gracias por tu compromiso de aprender con nosotros. Y para quienes nos acompañan hoy, por favor sepan, por el live stream, por favor sepan que estamos proveyendo interpretación del español al inglés y del inglés al, al español. Para acceso de lenguaje, por favor envíen un mensaje al chat de transmisión en vivo y nuestro equipo técnico les enviarán un enlace a cual pueden acceder. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bancha Linguas, for your um, your uh, walk with us as we get through, uh, as we go through trying to be more committed to language justice. We appreciate you growing with us. And if you're watching on the live stream and you need Spanish interpretation, let us know in the chat and we'll grant you access to the Zoom. Now, our Alternate Roots mission. Alternate Roots is an organization based in the Southern USA whose mission is to support the creation and presentation of original art in all its forms, which is rooted in a particular community of place, tradition, and spirit. As a coalition of cultural workers, we strive to be allies in the elimination of all forms of oppression. Roots is committed to social and economic justice and the protection of the natural world and addresses these concerns through its programs and services. Alternate Roots is supported by the generous donations from our gracious members, 
private individuals and funders, including, including the National Endowment for the Arts, Ford, Mellon, Cerna, and the Doris Duke Foundation. Now, if you are watching this live stream and watch and want to be engaged, click on the bubble in the right corner of the video um, that will activate the chat stream. If you're having other issues, reach out in the chat and we'll have someone assist. Um, also, our gender equity work group reminds us to all change our profile or chat name to include our pronouns. And if you're watching in from the live stream, you will need to refresh your screen so that you can rename yourself with your pronouns. We acknowledge uh, that we benefit from the wealth created from the forced removal of indigenous peoples across this continent that is called Turtle Island. We pay our respects to indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, who are the stewards of these lands. We also acknowledge enslaved Africans stolen from their homelands, whose forced labor helped to build this country. The ancestors and descendants of these people have and continue to weave the fabric of our culture. As we grow through the work of decolonization, we invite you to learn with us about the lands where you, where we currently live and where you currently live personally and build relationships at the speed of trust as we move from acknowledgement to action. Now, as you're adding your pronouns, drop in the chat where you're zooming in from. I'm here from the hunting lands of the Eastern Cherokee. If you know the names of the indigenous people who are stewards of the land you're currently occupying, drop that in the chat too. If not, we invite you to learn about land acknowledgement. We'll go ahead and drop a link to nativelands.us in, the, uh, in the, the chat for me, okay? Now let's go over our community agreements. I'm not gonna go uh, too deep into them, but a quick reminder that no matter how roots convenes, whether in space or virtually, we do so under the guidance of our community agreements. Um, someone is going to drop that link in the chat for your reference. It's extensive, but it's fair, and it keeps us all together and on the same page. Now, I want to um, also name our, our wellness committee, uh, they are extending a reminder, if you will. They remind us to take care of ourselves while we're in this virtual space. So grab some water, some snacks as needed, take your breaks. Um, all of that is encouraged so that we can continue to sustain here virtually. Now I'm gonna bring uh, Wendy into the space uh, for a few more grounding words. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome to everyone. Um, we come in today with, with heavy hearts. We know that 2020 was not the year that most of us expected it to be. We are dealing with so much loss and um, so much injustice in our world. And I think that the last two weeks has really just brought that all home. But since March, we've been grieving our community and the losses from COVID-19 and all of the residual things that have been lifted um, up and amplified because of loss of work, loss of insurance, loss of housing. We want to name today that we're also reeling from the compounded injustices when people are not held accountable for their violence. We want to uplift the names of people that we've lost and we want to hold in our hearts the people that are dealing with the grief, the remembering 
And this week we've lost people that were very close to us on our team, in our community, whose impact is felt across the region. And we wanna name that we have teammates who have lost family members this week. And so we come holding all of that weight. And so tonight we wanna hold some space for us to collectively breathe together, to grieve together, to honor and uplift the names of the people that we've lost, the names of the people that we're holding and renew our commitment to our community to make sure that we're checking on each other holding each other tight, loving on each other. So I wanna bring Leticia in, who is going to help us really ground in all of those things and more. Peace and blessings, Laxlo Klamatli. My name is Leticia. I'm so grateful to be able to hold space for us as family. Um, I use she, they, and I'm calling in from Akokisa land, Houston, Texas. And I wanna begin by just giving thanks to the Most High, whatever name and manifestation that may be, may we all give thanks in this moment. And Allow yourself to really, really feel comfortable and supported in where you are, wherever you're seated, and you feel your back supported, and you feel your bottom cushioned. And you feel even the tongue supported as it lays softly in your mouth. And I want to continue to give thanks to the way that our beloveds continue to weave this tapestry of stories, this ancient technology of knowledge and revolutionary love. <laughs> I had to start with a story. Um, just flow with me here. So my mother's a twin and her twin brother, my uncle Arnold cultivated this deep passion and love for books and reading. And my queer Chicano gay uncle left Texas, left his family of migrant workers to, with his brilliant mind, go to MIT. And he would send me these, these books uh, from his apartment in Roxbury, Massachusetts, my little 10-year-old self uh, in Southwest Houston. He sent me these books on African-American hist African historians and would have conversations with me about May Day workers of the world uniting. And to this day, like I love books so much. I walk into someone's home and when I see their books, it's like I fall deeper in love with them. And books are this own, this own thread of fabric that, keep, that knits us together. And I think back on my relationship and all the conversations that I had with Alandria and this amazing, fabulous collection of books that this person had. And I would go into their apartment and be like, hey, can I borrow this? And of course, Alandria was like, no, but maybe I'll buy a copy for you. Or at the time I was living in Knoxville. So that lovely human was even like, maybe I'll give you a ride to McKay's used bookstore and you can go get your own copy. <laughs> And I just, I just, there's these moments where you, you just see embolences of other people who you are your beloveds in each other because we're all reflections of one another. So in times when it's, I'm really at a loss of, of my own words or making sense of the world and, and, and the universe and the divine, I, I go right back to my books 
And in this Bruja motion, there's this idea of divination through books. So calling upon the books to reveal themselves to you. You just open it up and that's exactly what you needed in that present moment to see, right? And so in the last 48 hours, the books that I've recently picked up that are leading me into this flow are um, The Places That Scare You, A Guide to Fearlessness in Difficult Times by Pema Chodron, and Spider Speculations by Arjir Joe Carson. <laughs> and like these ancestors, they're like, hey, you're never alone. <laughs> I'm right here with you. Yeah, además, Kim Pivio mentioned that grandmother's hands and I immediately had to go find it. <laughs> and this is just this like ancient technology, right? All these reminders, no? And, and so I, I had to write down notes because I was like, <laughs> emotions. <sighs> in Mayan, in Mayan, they say that, you know, the colonists have lots of stories of destruction and rebuilding, but those who are the keepers of the land, we have stories of creation, right? And in Mayan cosmology, we talk of Ichel, the goddess of the moon and the water and the weaving of childbirth, the spider woman who sings the web of the universe into being. And Elandria, I feel like created all of these amazing webs. Like right now I can feel the energy across the world of this web. And I just imagine as the spider's web catches the morning dew, this beautiful art of interconnectedness. Everything is so vibrantly and extravagantly interconnected. She introduced the art of weaving to the people. So right now, I just ask you again to find that support in your seat and your space. You can close your eyes or soften your gaze. Do any organic movement that feel, feels like it's calling you and then again, come back to the stillness. Take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, begin by feeling your feet rooting into the earth. Feel the connection of your pelvis, even with the floor. And with your next exhale, locate yourself in this room. Locate your sit bones connecting to your seat. And your next out breath, lift your crown to the sky. And as you inhale, lift your heels up off the floor. And then as you exhale, gently place them underneath you if they're not there already. Sense the presence of your breath flowing through your body. Sense the presence of your breath filling up the space that holds you. On an in-breath, float your shoulders up and on an out breath, roll and ease them down your spine. Feel the full expansion of your chest, open and exposed in your heart space. With your inhale and in your length, feel a sense of inherent dignity. What inherent dignity means is, it is something that cannot be given to you and therefore it cannot be taken away. Now in your with, I want you to sense the relationships by including the space and then all the people that surround you. Now take an awareness of your body and your back body, your front body and your back body all the way through. Eyes on the horizon, notice the generations in front of you and feel your ancestors behind you. With a strong back and a soft belly, take up the space that is your depth. 
Now, finally, I want you to drop your attention and your center of gravity down into your belly. Connect to what matters. You don't have to save the world, just to connect to what matters to you. Feel your openness and expansiveness here, right now, in this moment. Use breath to shift any places that feel stuck or uneasy. Deep breath in. Exhale, let something go. And then place your palms together, rub your hands together slightly, and then begin to warm them up a little bit more, just awakening your body. And take close hands and place them over your heart. Feel your heart, feel your palms. And then breathe in so deep that you're breathing in that love to all those around you and can sense their love being sent directly to your heart. Thank you, y'all. Love y'all. Thank you. Love you. Thank you for that, Letty. Thank you. Um, I, I thought it was a good um, time to talk about uh, how this curation came to be. Um, how did we come up with these particular conversations? Um, of course, you know, when we first started thinking about Roots Week, we were thinking about it from a physical point of view. Then COVID happened and we went straight, we went straight to virtual. Um, we reached out to a few people, not a few people, people had already uh, applied to participate in Roots. So we had uh, presentations, but those presentations were going to need to be shifted because of the state that we're in. Um, so I really want to talk to um, this particular thing. Um, I don't think I had an opportunity to really introduce myself. My name is Lauren Fitzgerald. I go by she, her, hers, they pronouns. I had the absolute pleasure of co-curating Roots Week alongside Indy Mitchell. Uh, he has been an amazing organizer and colleague as we move to curate this programming for this very special Roots convening. This theme resonated me, with me even before COVID or even the uprisings. Um, I grew up in Memphis and so I grew up in a space where Dr. Martin Luther King was heavily talked about uh, through the dark history of his uh, murder and assassination in Memphis. So I've heard these words before and never, never in a moment in history that I've lived through have they resonated more so now. This theme this year, the fierce urgency of now, we, want, we hope to have created experiences where folks will gain inspiration, motivation, and knowledge to act fiercely, urgency, urgently, and now. Um, I, I often kid about the time construct. Time is of, of where your mind is. Um, so now, not necessarily being, being the time now, but being the urgency, of being now as an adjective, right? What is now meaning um, in your body? How does now uh, in your work? So thinking about now in a, in a space where we kind of bend it to mean, uh, to describe a point of reference is something that we were really playing with. So we formed a panel to vet these presentations. Some of you served on the panel, so thank you so very much. Um, we had conversations with the presenters. Presenters backed out, presenters threatened to back out because of COVID. 
we begged, we pleaded, we paid attention to how they talked about their work. And the way we curated it was within the three weekends. The first weekend is the fierce weekend. And it's based off of how our interpretation of how these presenters presented their work to us. The second weekend is urgent. And then it bleeds into the third weekend, which is now, which is really focused in youth and technology and what is the future. So, and we also wanted to center voices that were being uh, grossly marginalized. Black trans women are dying at a disproportionate rate. You know, we can't get justice for sleeping in our beds and just being and getting shot and killed. So we wanted to center some voices that don't necessarily get centered in these conversations at your major conventions and convenings. So I hope that you have uh, appreciated how this has been curated. I hope you've appreciated the workshops, the pollinations, the, the conversations that are being had. And I hope you feel motivated to take this and do something in your communities do something in your world to actually move the needle on justice because we need it. So with that being said, I'm going to pass it to my brother, Joe. Um, I, I really wanna talk about all of the panel cause I love everybody on the panel, uh, but I'm gonna to toss it to Joe so he can ground us um, and get us started with our conversation around the fierce urgency of now this evening. And cheers, because this is a this is a uh, a happy hour uh, conversation. So cheers, Joe. Whew. Um. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Um. Joe Talbert. Um. For access. Um. I'm wearing a black shirt and a black hat with glasses with white words that say worthy. Um, and as many of you all know, um, on Wednesday evening, um, we lost Alandria Williams, um, an amazing mentor, teacher, friend to many of us. Um, and I met Alandria when I was 19 um, as a participant um, to the Seeds of Fire camp that um, he used to run. And there was something about that space that made me want to do more of it, experience more of it. Um, and so that started a multi-year decade or more um, friendship, mentorship, um, an accompaniment um, and I'm just now learning <laughs> really what all I have learned from Melandria um, and one of the one of the last things that Alandria left us all um, was a poem that they posted to their Facebook um, called We Are Worthy um, and when you know somebody because I'm 32 now. I'll let y'all do the math because I'm not good at it. And I have a cocktail right now. So after all of those years, um, you go through changes with each other. And one of the changes that I noticed in our conversations over the last year and a half was that I was always reminded um, through our work at People's Hub that it is just as important how you do the work and not just only about the work that you do. And one of the things um, Alandria would always say to me is, Joe, we have to keep care at the center. And so um, I've just been thinking about that a lot and how we are with each other um, and how we need to keep care at the center. And so um, I'm gonna share the offering that Alandria shared with all of us via a Facebook status. Um, and the poem is called, We Are Worthy. <sighs> we are worthy, not because of what we produce, 
but because of who we are. We are divine bodies of light and darkness. You are not worthy because of what you offer, not because of what is in your mind, not for the support you give others, not for what you give at all. We are worthy and are whole just because in this great turning, in this great pandemic, in this radical readjustment and alignment, we are not disposable. We are needed. We are the very people that have withstood everything that has been thrown at us as people. And as Maya Angelou would say, still I rise. We arise from the pain. We rise from the grief. We arise from the limits people place on us and the limits we place on ourselves. We rise to be the children and the ancestors. We rise to be our true selves, our true selves in relationship to our families and communities. Recognizing our liberating and whole selves, honoring them and others as we strive for the abundant communities, abundant lives, abundant relationships, and abundant values and cultural manifestations we are worthiness personified. I, you, and we are worthy and deserve a life where we are not always fighting for our existence. Imagine what we could create if we are not always in the struggle. Imagine what we could envision if we could just be let to just go there. So tired of always having to resist, to fight, demanding, pushing to everyone that has the courage, the power, the ability to co-create what we want and need while rooting in what we can't lose and who we are. You are the visionary. You are the hope. You are our ancestors' dream. No, you might not ever end up on some list somewhere, but you are on a list in someone's heart and mind. And if it's in how you move in the world so people can see by example, you are the embodiment of what we need. Thanks to all that are the embodiment. The embodiment not of productivity, but the embodiment of radical love, care, and sanctuary. It is time, embodiment time, embodiment, living one's values out loud. Let me every day live my values out loud. Let us every day live our values out loud, embodying our values, not the productivity quotient, beyond the productivity, past productivity, true embodiment life. I'm gonna say that again, cause I feel it. It is time, embodiment time, embodiment living one's values out loud. Let me live, let me every day live my values out loud. Let us every day live our values out loud, embodying our values, not the productivity quotient, beyond productivity, past productivity, true embodiment life. So I'm gonna do a very Alandria thing right now. And I'm just gonna ask us all to take a breath, mostly because I need to take a breath. <laughs> so if we can inhale and hold it and exhale. One more inhale, inhale and hold it and exhale. So when I think about the title of our time together, um, I think it's encapsulated by the end of Alandria's poem. Um, it's time we live our values out loud. Um, and at the moment, I'm struggling for words, um, but when I think about living our values out loud, I'm 
I'm thinking about how that brings into a new way of being with ourselves and a new way of being with each other because we can fight, we can resist, we can fight, we can resist. But I feel that when we embody our values, when we live out our values, when we practice new ways of being and moving in the world, those things can stay where they are, but we're building something new in the midst of it. And so when I think about the fierce urgency of now, I'm thinking about how we can build while rooting in what we can't lose and how we take those things that need to be taken forward forward while living and creating something that is antithetical to the ways that we have been conditioned to live, the ways that we are forced to crunch ourselves into these systems that mean nothing but our death and demise. So that's my offering to get us started. And I'm just so thankful that Carpetbag Theater, one of the founding groups of Roots, saw fit to take me to Seeds of Fire to where my paths could cross with Alandria. And that my life could be forever changed because they thought enough of me and they saw something in me to know that being in what Alandria called the liberated space of Seeds of Fire could do for my becoming. And so I just wanna say thank you to Linda and Marquez who were in charge of the Tri Ensemble for allowing me this life-changing opportunity. So I'm gonna stop talking so I can finish crying and turn it over to my comrades, my family, Sage and Nia. Hey beloved, oh, yes, please cry. Please cry. Deep love. Hey, Sage. <laughs> hey, Mia. Um, yeah, thank you, Joe, for bringing us open, openness like that. I just want to... Also, yes, I'm going to breathe because I need to. Just like you, Joe, I, I met Alandria <laughs> at a Seeds of Fire, funny enough. Um, and it was the first thing I've ever did. Like, I had just joined this organization called Breakout. Um, and basically, sorry, my computer was tripping out. Um, I had just joined this organization called Breakout and they sent me <laughs> to this thing in Seas of Fire. And I was like, what the hell, Where am I? what is all this? What am I doing? Like, I heard we would organize with the trans folks, like as someone who's like loosely film, I'm like trying to find my identity, let's do it. Um, and I got there and it was one of those moments where I was just like blown away. I was like, oh, there's a whole world out there of things that I don't know about and that I'm also directly impacted by. Um, and Alandria was leading the camp. I was leading the camp in that moment and just was so amazing and so sweet. And like, was like, <laughs> she definitely had the, um, uh, like the moments of like, okay, Nia, I see, and I didn't use that name at the time. Of like, okay, Nia, you cute and you nice and all, but don't think that don't mean I'm gonna push, not gonna push you. Don't think that means I'm not gonna ask you the hard questions because you're cute and you're smiling in my face. Mm -hmm. And just that, that type of courage to like push trans queer and black folks to be their best selves not to just be like oh you're doing so good you know to really kind of get us to the next level consistently just by engaging with this um it's just kind of at the core of who Alandria was she was the first person to teach me e cooperative economics she was like studying something i was like what does that mean like how can we break all of these systems and she was like actually and funny enough leticia she gave me a oh, she didn't give me a book but she lent me a book um it was like a horton reader or something like that i don't really remember the exact title um and she was like, you gonna learn? And she was studying cooperative economics. And um, it's because of Alandria that I know that there are systems that exist outside capitalism. And she was one of my, funny enough, one of my first mentors. So just the fact that we have very parallel stories, it just shows how how massive <laughs> like, you know, like her touch was and how how expansive her like love shown throughout our community. And these are different years, I'm sure that this happened and in different parts of the country. And she just like, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, she just, it just shows <laughs> that she has had such an impact just by her time here. Um, I think 
the last thing that I'll say um, about Alandria is that she did, she be, and she was, it reminds me too, because Wendy and how connected we all are, Wendy O'Neill was, who was also one of my great mentors, fellow mm -hmm. Aquarian, love of our like, love of like person I love. Um, <laughs> right, it was one of the first people to help build Seas of Fire. And for me to go through that with Alandria there, I mean, now Wendy is my mentor, Alandria my mentor. It just reminds me of how interconnected we all are. Um, and how we literally are seeds of fire. All the seeds we plant grow in so many different ways. And who would know that all these years later, you and I would be <laughs> kicking it, having cocktails, crying, honoring Alandria. Mm -hmm. I'ma just, you know, I'ma just sing our little song. Was it P O W E R? We got the power because we are seeds of fire. <laughs> and that's I know yeah. that one. So you're gonna have to like record it in a book memo and send it. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Sage, I guess it's on you when you're ready. Um, I, I'll, I'll pick up from uh, uh, something you said, Mia, and I am thinking about um, that how in our in our lifetime sometimes we may we we rel we rarely have a sense of the breadth and reach of of ourselves in the work right um in the work that we're doing because we're in the midst of it and we're doing it right um and I, I part of what um i hope becomes a, a practice of ours is like how do we put the people that we know in conversation with folks who are who are on pedestals or who are considered like visionaries, right? Like there's something about uplifting Alandria in the midst of this conversation around the fierce urgency of now that for me is putting Alandria in conversation, like her words in conversation with the words of Dr. King, which is where they belong, given her influence and her impact in the world, that's where she belongs, right? Um, and and the um, the the, um, and I'm, I'm also sitting with this, the, the topic, like the fierce urgency of now, mm -hmm. but also in the ways that um, what happens now breeds, right? Like what happens now, I think we're using the word pollinates, or, or, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the roots week right now, that um, it is not always um, our ability to see that, but it is our community's responsibility to keep people's names in our mouths. It is our responsibility to uplift their impact on us. It is our ability, it's our responsibility to reach out to them and say, you know, I know it was only 15 minutes, but let me tell you how that changed me. Right? Let me tell you how that changed me. Let me tell you how sitting in a rocking chair or that book you gave me, let me tell you what that has meant for the trajectory of my life what that has meant then, there's a, um, a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, uh, folks do a lot of Octavia Butler references, and I am, I am not immune. I am definitely a, a, an advocate that says, you know, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. And I've been really thinking about that a lot lately because all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. But that also means that all that you touch that has changed you changes the people that you touch. Right? So there's like another next there's like another next level to to the ways in which we are are um, um, constantly in in inside um, our own transformation when we can be aware of it when we can name it uh, and when we can when we can water it um, the the ending you shared Joe. Um, uh, uh, like how how will we be ourselves at the end of the poem? Like what does embodiment time mean? How are we living our values? Um, just really called to me about like how not just are we living it, but how do we continue to be transformed and continue to live it more and more deeply? And for me and my relationship with Alandra, like I would be like, ah, oh, you know, I'm I'm really curious about this thing, and she's like, here, here, read this, right? <laughs> I think we're all on the here, read this. I don't. I I wouldn't have one third of the economic understanding I do if I hadn't, you know, ran into a conversation with Alandria like somewhere like for five minutes 
got a book list and then was off and running in, you know, a decade later, it's still something that's very resonant in, in my life and in my work, you know, and I think there's this, this invitation in, um, in, uh, in the poem, in a land, in the poem, in the, in the exemplar of Alandria's life, um, that echoes even in this like, urgency of now, like, what are we being urgent about? Right? Like, what are we being urgent about? And for me, this um, is, is really hitting, like, are we being urgent about um, how we are deepening our embodiment, how we are deepening our connection with each other, and how we are uh, um, uh, shaping the transformation that is happening. Right? As cultural workers, we understand our individual transformation has such deep resonance. It is, it is how culture gets transmitted, you know, and uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of what I'm sitting with right now. Yeah, I thank you for that, Sage. I think <laughs> whenever you said, like, what are we being urgent about? I think that's a really important question because particularly now, I think more than ever, I think what we should be being urgent about is centering our wholeness and our wellness um, and like maintaining it too, right? I think some one of the best things, and I think I say this a little bit, so people, if y'all heard it before, my bad. Um, like our work can't be like, it hits its sweet spot whenever we're doing the organizing work, we're doing the organizing practice work, um, we're developing a leaderful movement, but it only really hits its sweet spot whenever it involves like that healing and wellness. So we have policies that are shifting and campaigns that are happening. We're developing leaders along the way. Um, and at the same time, we're maintaining the wellness of those leaders and we're sustaining each other as a community. Um, and so for me, I think we, we know that we have to organize. I think we inherently leaders are going to be developed just by being in space. We're, I'm, we're a result in some ways, all of us are a result of the people who came before us, for me and Joe, particularly Elandria in some ways. Um, so we're going to develop leaders, but I think we really have to get to a structural practice of wellness practice, um, if it being at the top of our conversations. And for me, that's what I'm interested in being urgent about. And, it, and actually, sometimes we do it really well. Like we, we took our time today before we got to this. Y'all know some other spaces would have been like, <laughs> here's the panel, let's go, <laughs> right? But actually this is intentionally crafted in ways that were about easefulness, that were about inclusion of language justice and gender equity that took time to ground us. And like it gave us time to mourn. <laughs> and I think we need to have that replicated across all of our work, because if we're not urgent around maintaining our wellness and our wholeness, then we're just going to keep fizzling out. We're going to keep, and oh my God, when Alandria talks about productivity, that's what I think of too. We're not just here to produce. We're not just here to be part of the prize think work ethic. We're actually here to like be in space with each other, to love on each other, to have, to be radical embodiments of love. And for me, that's what I'm interested in being urgent about. Um, and I love that you asked that. What is the, yeah, what are we being urgent about in this moment? Um, and another thing, obviously, I'm urgent about developing black trans leadership, sustaining black trans leadership. I think that goes, I mean, well, it doesn't go without saying it, so I should say it. <laughs> I think it makes sense. Black trans femme leadership, black trans leadership overall. Um, and for me, those are the things. So like centering our wholeness, our awareness, creating like structural practices that like as many, if you're gonna talk about campaign, if you're gonna do a strategic planning, you better have a big, big, big space in that for organizational wellness, for individual wellness. Um, and if you're gonna be doing a strategic planning or if you're gonna be in space with your people, you better have your people, you better have black trans people, you better have black women, you better have black femmes at the table too. Thank, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so you wanna jump in? I'm sitting with a lot right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I can step in it while you're, while you're marinating and, and breathing. Myself, right? And I, I grabbed the book and <laughs> it's just going to sit there until it's time to read what's in the book, since that's mm -hmm. going to be a general thing tonight. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I am so grateful for you bringing in health and wellness Mia, into this. And um, I think one of the things that um, we are trying to learn how to do in movement right now, in particular, is how to hold the individual and the collective inside that, right? Inside this idea of wellness and well-being. Um, to be really, you know, to be really honest, like I know I have been in spaces where 
I have felt abandoned while folks have felt like I need to care for myself. Right. And I'm like, I need to, I need, this is self-care. And I'm like, well, what the fuck happened to the rest of us? Right. Like what happened? <laughs> you know, like how, how, how is that, how is that getting us to liberation? Like, you know, you know, and so um, really kind of thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we care for ourselves and think about the relationship between um, what we are doing and how we care for ourselves and the, the, uh, the larger impact it has on our communities, on our closest, on our intimates, on our communities and, and on our, um, on our political beliefs, like on what we, what we, you know, think about the world, right. You know, um, I often get in, in, uh, reminded in my own household, like self-care doesn't mean going to buy some old shit, right. Like self-care to me, you know, and there's nothing wrong, you know, that's a thing, you know, but that they're also, if I'm going to talk about back to living my values, right. I'm going to talk about the detriments of, of racialized capitalism how am I in, how am I interrupting that in my own life Mm -hmm. in relationship to like how I think about care for myself and other folks. Right. And so I think about like the, the, that, and I, and, and the reality is we can hold that. Like we can hold that complexity. It's not to say that like there's a, that this is as a spectrum, like there's one spot on on the spectrum you stay and you can, and and that's where you are. Right. Like it's, it's constantly swinging. And I think the invitation from Elantria, the invitation, even in, in the in the the piece from Dr. King is like to be thoughtful about it, right? To 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 have a, to have a moment like even the whole the whole uh, speech that um, the fierce urgency of now the the topic came from is actually King doing a self assessment mm-hmm. of where he has not spoken up, of where he is not engaged, of where he has not gone far enough, right? And and I think that that that. Um, does that really, that piece is really uh, um, resonant for me around like how we think about our engagement. I think there's also the, um, uh, um, I want to be really um, urgent about our imagination, about really, really urgent about um, our ability to dream, um, our time and space to dream, Mm-hmm. Are, uh, um, and and I don't know if urgent is the word, but it 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 feels kind of like the right word. There is a way that urgency lives in the body that I was saying earlier in one of our earlier calls. That I'm not a fan of real talk. I'm just not a fan of it. When shit becomes urgent, you become tight. You're like, oh, it's urgent. Oh my god, I got you know. It's like you know. I was thinking, you know, it's like if you have to move, right? And you have like 48 hours, you don't actually sift through things. You just like throw everything in a garbage bag and take it with you. But we actually have to think about not only what we don't want to lose, but what we do want to lose. Oh. Right? So like urgency uh, takes away, in some ways, takes away the time that we need to figure out what we're not going to take with us. Right? Like, uh, um, and so how do we engage sort of that? So I'll vote, yeah. I don't know if urgency is the word I want to talk about around imagination, but I feel uh, passionate. And maybe that's actually more. And, and even when I say passionate in relation to a conversation around Alandria, that feels right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was just listening to y'all uh, both on the wellness tip and this thing about the imagination. Uh, one of the things. Uh, since the hashtag is going around, Alandria taught us. Um, one of the things that I've learned over this last year and a half is that not only do we need to use the imagination for where we're going and like that freedom dream, but we also need to imagine, reimagine rather, how we do the work. Because um, I think in this moment, where the pandemic is happening and there's, I don't know, fear or whatever around gathering. If it's all, if it's truthfully said, we've only imagined the work as being like outward protest or being in the street. And so when I think about my friend, my mentor, it's like, there came a point in time where he could no longer be in the street. Mm -hmm. So I'm also thinking about if we're talking about care and wellness, 
how are we reimagining what the work could look like to where we're not throwing people away because they may need to take time off to heal. They may need to take time off and not be protesting in the streets in the way that we have come to know the work. And so for me, part of the imagination is connected to wellness and reimagining in real time what can we be doing to where all of us are included and none of us are thrown away, none of us are left behind because they can no longer do the work in the ways that we have made it the way we do the work. And so I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, in my accompaniment with me, I have learned a ton about ableism and disability justice, how it's replicated in our movements and how it leaves a whole group of people behind because we've only imagined the work to be this one thing, this one way. You can only do it when you're out in the streets protesting and, and those things are important. So I'm not trying to say that those things aren't important, but we have to expand and grow bigger if our value is that we all have a place in the work, then we need to also put into practice the way the work is done that includes everybody being a part of the work. And so, yeah. And this is a, to use Miles Horton's word, this is a long, this is for the long haul, you know? We may get wins, but the system will recalibrate and we have to keep in it. And so also just on a practical level, for us all to stay in it, we have to reimagine how we work so that we can stay in it for the long haul. And taking an abundance frame to know that if I can't, someone will step in, that I don't have to shoulder this weight all on myself and grind myself to dust. So, so yeah, those are the things that are resonating from what you both said. Um, in reference to wellness. Um. I love, I just, I just love that so much. <laughs> like, I just makes, just hearing the word abundance, like frame, like, that just makes me glow. I'm like, yes, how do we operate from that? Thank you for that, Joe. It makes so much sense too. And like, for a few reasons, I think, like the first thing is that like, the being on the streets and protesting is one of, one part of a larger thing that needs to be happening. Like there needs to be people who are cooking the food in the kitchen. There needs to be people who are translating. There needs to be folks who are writing policy changes. There needs to be folks. So we need to be tapping into creating leaderful movements so that we see and value all the stuff equally. It's not just the person who gets on the megaphone. Mm -hmm. It's the person who staged us down before we went to the march. It's the person who we came home to and who has some Cooler Ranch packs. Oh, what are they called? Not Cooler Ranch, that's Doritos. <laughs> The Capri Suns, that's what I'm talking about. Who <laughs> have the Capri Suns? The most goofy. Um, and like really seeing the value in all it's it's the people who are passing down Miles Horton books. It's like we need to have this leaderful movement where we're valuing everybody. I love that you said that. Um, and shout out to our pollination speaker, Camille, who's gonna talk a little bit about disability justice. And that's and um so when organizations at, at this level, so regional organizations and national organizations. Your conversation should be including disability justice and should be including ableism so we can continue to uplift the inherent value of everybody's contribution. Um, and thank you, Sage, for talking about imagination. What came up for me too when you said that was culture bear the role of culture bearers. I think in like artists, right? It's our job to provide that space for imagination. It's our job to any imagination we could think of it as a battlefield in some ways, right? Because we know that the same the same people who imagined like if we know we can think of it as a battlefield like we it's necessary that we use our imagination it's necessary that we dream because we know what happens when other folks dream they create whole systems that change and shift and morph over time just how slavery comes from, just like how prisons come from slave catchers right we know that they create systems that change and morph with their imagination mm -hmm. their imagination is used to steal labor so they don't have to work so it's really important for us to actually use our imagination and think of it as a tool that's very necessary for us to creating and addressing like morphing systemics of oppression and creating our own answers and institutions and practices that are morphing as they need to morph, right? Um, what does it mean for me to maybe start as like someone who is on the front lines and kind of then someone who is able to morph my practices in different places um, and really being in that spot. And so 
for me, I think imagination comes from are the things I think of are like how we have to think of imagination as a, a like a right and a critical right and a necessary for us to get where we're going. And I think cultural workers and artists really provide a container for folks to imagine. The healing work does too. When you're doing guided visualizations, you're imagining the world that you want to live in. You're creating that pathway. Like whenever you're doing affirmations, you're reminding yourself of what's inherently valuable. You're recreating that brainwave or that thought um, and making space for that newness, right? And so imagination, and the last thing I'll say about that um, is experiments. I think my, I have a great, I love the like song Nola chapter because we keep saying when you have to do many experiments to try it, like, Southern Organizer Academy is an experiment that Key Jackson and I started. And, and, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, wow, we did that interestingly. And sometimes we're like, you know, in, in all of our work, I'm sure we have to try experiments to kind of get to where we're going. So I would say folks should lean into little experiments, lean into community gardens, like lean into these little moments of like trying something and trying new things. And um, artists and cultural workers, cultural workers really can create that container where we can imagine something new. Those are the things that came up. And I just, yeah, I'm just really thankful for that. <laughs> oh, thank you, Nia. Um, cause, and y'all can see how this goes, right? Like one of us is like, oh, that made me think of, that's pretty much gonna be like what, what happens when the three of us get together. And I see some questions in the chat, so we'll try and work those in uh, at the same time. Cause I think Nia also just left us, left off with talking about like, practice, which is which is showing up in, in one of the conversations, one of the questions. Um, I think one of the one of the things that I'm thinking about right now is um, sort of the thread thread that um, um, both of y'all talking about is what does it mean for our bodies of work to be in relationship with each other? Mm. Right? Because I, I, I wanna I wanna I don't I don't feel equal to leaving this conversation and not acknowledging that people are dying. Right, like, and I mean, like, our friends are dying. Like, these are people are dying in the street. People are being murdered at judicial. Like, there is a a a a, a way in which um, we sort of sometimes separate that over here and cultural work over here, right? Like, and I think one of the things that um, Alandria was speaking about around, like, in, often talk about, like, what does an integrated movement look like, right? Like, what does it mean for us to be folks who are doing direct action, folks who are doing imagination? folks who are thinking about economic systems, folks who are thinking about how care happens inside the family, folks who are thinking about uh, um, uh, 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 how we feed ourselves and food pathways, all to be in concert and working together, both um, in, in, in terms of how we think about the timeline of change and also what we think about are the mechanisms that will create change in, 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 in real time, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, this, that feels really, and, and I think that is part of Joe, in particular, what you said around um, how do we value things equally, right? To me, understanding that uh, that is a space, that movement work is a space for all of us to be there um, feels really important, right? Like, I, 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 I not only um, understand my own value, I understand my own value in relationship to this, this change that is happening. And so I'm not, I don't need to get, you know, hmm. Well, it's nice to be invited. You know, you don't want to necessarily crash a party, but shit, sometimes you gotta, you'd be like, I'm supposed to be here. You know, I'm supposed to be here. And, and as culture workers, we, we, we are supposed to be in so many places that A, we may not get invited to, or B, we get invited to sing a song at, or, you know, C, you know, we get invited in so many sort of like sideways um, that uh, uh, I, I, I hope and I believe that we are moving towards a time when um, we have a better fullness, a better understanding of the fullness of what change and transformation requires, and that we not only are in inviting each other, but that we understand that we are indispensable um, as part of, of the, the this project, this experiment, this this transformation. Because I, I do appreciate this question around practice and experiment, Mia. Yeah, uh, um, Sometimes we feel like the, the practice is so large, we, we can't get started, right? Experiment invites us into a rhythm. As culture workers, I feel rhythm. I feel rhythm a lot. You know, like how do we, how do we be in the, the testing and the experimentation? The, there's a rigor to experimentation too, right? Like that, that we are assessing it, that we are, there are some ideas or hypotheses that we're testing or trying something. Um, and that, that relationship between cultural work and, 
and, and practice, like it is all part of our practice. It is all part of our, our tool. It's, and it's important for us to be clear to me about the role of our practice in the transformation. Right. And the view that everything is iterative, right? Wow. Like we place so much, I mean, like literally, the work is a matter of life and death. Like we get that, right? But to allow ourselves to do a thing, to learn, to change a thing and that constant growing. Um, and I've been thinking about, so I've been in um, some work with a trans Latinx theologian who wrote this amazing book that ironically enough is beside me, Activist Theology. <laughs> And um, they use this concept of becoming. And I think so much we try to get to an end goal, but even at that end goal, there's more to more beyond that. And so this concept of becoming has been just such a delight to revel in, to know that even when I get to where the plan says I need to go, that I'm still even at that moment in a process of becoming. So how do we see the movement spaces, the places where we are creating sanctuary as just one stop on a perpetual becoming. And that, and I feel like so much of our internal mirrors the external and even in our internal world, since we're um, presencing wellness, how does our internal take the path of becoming? Like, how am I constantly doing what I need to stay whole and sustain in the midst of these death dealing systems and how even when I do that, it's a perpetual becoming, it's a perpetual practice, it's a perpetual getting there, it's a perpetual going towards this freedom dream and that in our becoming, we get a little further and a little further and a little further. And so I'm also sitting with that um, and how that gets us along the path that that shift of just not an end destination has just been so liberating to know <laughs> that just I can be in my becoming however I am at the moment and just be able to show up fully in that moment of becoming and knowing that that's not the final stop. Um, and so I just wanted to throw that in there because that shift in frame from like an end goal to a becoming has just been so freeing and liberating in my spirit mm -hmm. that where I am now is not where I'm going to end up. Oh my God. I love that. That's, <laughs> I love that's liberating for you. Cause in some ways it's so like, it's a challenge for me. Cause I'm like, and this talks about like, and this is showing my like being, uh, being like perfection. I'd want it to come off as a certain way, which I need to release. Cause I'm like, oh my God, I'll never be. And there's this inherent struggle to my mind. I'm like, I'm always like, I just want to be enlightened. I just want to, I just want to have all the analysis. And I just want to, and I think, I don't, I don't know if it's a, a, if it happens to other folks who are doing this work, but I am, I like constantly, I'm like, I just want to reach it to where I have a, the best analysis. And I, and I walk into the room and my auras are all in alignment and like, but so it gives me anxiety knowing that this is a lifelong journey of deepen, deepening my becoming. And in some ways it actually releases the perfectionism and it actually allows more room for liber. You're right, it is. Li okay, look at me in real time learning. I'm like, it's, it's, it's liberating. This is, <laughs> it is like, there's no end goal. You're just consistently becoming more and more of what you want to be and lit more. You practice more and more of living your values. And when you said that, I saw a deep connection to what Sage was saying about um, like how we get deeper into our practice and how it's an everyday thing. Um, and I think one of my homies, Key says, Key Jackson says, like liberation is a hundred thousand million decisions you make throughout the day. Um, and so like when you, I just, when you said that, I was like freaking out at first and then I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to be enlightened being, but it actually, it's not like that. It's just that you're continuously deepening this practice. Um, and it's something that you practice every day, kind of like Sage was saying. And so. I guess it's freeing. And then in some ways we should all lean into that. <laughs> it's actually okay. Like you're constantly gonna be on this like pathway, but it's a good thing though. It's not like this, you're not, you didn't make, it's not like you need to make an A on the test, which is something that comes from all, I mean, I can only assume the institutionalized learning, but like, <laughs> yeah. That I'm really bring perfection. <laughs> you know, not alone. Well, I mean, we, we all are. We all are, cause that's white supremacist culture, right? 
Mm. We all are. We're all, we are, everything, everything has equal weight. Everything is enormous. Everything has, you know, I, I, I was listening to you, Joe, and I, I thought about um, Toni Morrison's quote around like racism um, of primary function is, is as distraction, right? We're, 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 we're inculcated with this sense of like, we have to get it right. We have to get it right. And I think part of what, what you're experiencing, what I enjoy, like I think a lot about um, the mandate for black people that, um, uh, you know, Mary Hook shared in like the last line of be, be transformed in the service of the work. Like to make that as a named intention, to be transformed in the service of the work puts you in relationship with folks differently, right? So like, I'm doing this work because I am an ally. I am doing this work because I want the world to be better for everyone. Yes, and expect yourself, put yourself in the center to be transformed in the service of the work and, I, and, and do it in a way that, um, uh, uh, how can we figure out, this is back to like how we do the work. How do we do the work in a way that this iteration, and I feel you, Nia, this idea of like constantly working, right? How does that become joy? How does that become our joy? How does that become pleasure? How does that, you know, does it mean, I, I know for me, it's like doing it with people, right? Like I got a little social studies pod, there's like three or four of us, and I love getting together with them, right? Like I, I just love them and I love talking with them. And so this kind of transformation doesn't feel like like me by myself reading a book on my couch, you know, underline that, that, you know, that's cool and everything. But when I get with other folks and I'm like, yo, I just read this thing. Have you read it? Or like, I tried this and oh my God, it was a mess. Help, help. You know, like that, that, that for me personally, like that is, that is what it means. You know, when I, going back to Alandria's poem, like what does it mean to live? Like, like the embodiment of life, you know, and, and how does that life, that animated source, be a part of um, how we think about this constant iteration and, and this constant growth we're in, in the midst of. But right. by having cocktails. <laughs> All right. But in the life of which I'll be right back. <laughs> in that life, though, I think there needs to be an extension of grace. And I think at this moment, mm. so many of our movement spaces are imploding because we don't know how to extend grace enough, don't know how to extend that grace as a way of working through conflict enough. And so I'm just thinking about life is messy. Like, life is fucking messy. And we're gonna mess up on the process of becoming, right? And so how do we, and this also goes back to how we are in relationship to each other, right? How do I extend grace to you when you wronged me, Sage? Do I mm -hmm. immediately just dismiss you and discard you and say, well, I'm never going to work with Sage again because they did X, Y, and Z. And that to me is not what I think of when I think of liberation and freedom. It's all of us being in relationship to each other, me saying, Sage, I'm extending grace and I'm going to talk through it. I'm good, you know, and so mm -hmm. I've just also been sitting with that and how life is messy. Mm -hmm. and yes, life is a part of this thing. And we want the joys, but of course, with the joy comes also the cycle of the low times, the difficult, the struggle. And so how are we in struggle with each other, knowing that we're not going to get it right, but extending grace in the midst of not getting it right to move us further along the path of becoming? Mm. Mm, sure. mm. Yeah, I'm just going to stop there because I felt a, a preacher moment happening. No, I was like gone because what? I'm like, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the movement church. <laughs> no, that's good. And I think it brings up. Sorry, say you gonna... No, go ahead, Mia. <laughs> I was gonna say no, I think that's dope. And I think it brings up experiments again and how we do experiments. Um, which is that like, oh, these experiments will sometimes be go weird and like we just have to hold grace with each other through that process. And I'm like, I keep going back to the structural wellness, the structural like organizations of the root size, organizations of song size, even our own little mini operations, even our just 
actually just in our families, in our friend circles, we need to have a practice of like restorative practice. We need to have restorative and transformative practice. We need to have, like, we need to be able to create ways in which we can like hold each other and maintain each other's wholeness through like trauma and through pain. And so um, I'm assuming it sounds like we don't believe in cancel culture between us. <laughs> it doesn't look like we're team cancel culture, but that kind of brings up the now to me because now everyone else is kind of cancel culture-y and how we kind of push back on that. And, oh my God, my my, my sibling spirit brought up today. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading the chat and I just got a good chuckle from Hannah. So pay me no mind. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like my friend spirit today was telling me about, um, what does it mean to really talk about like abolition and transformative justice? So in this, we're with you in the struggle, who are we struggling with? Are, do all these cops need to be arrested or is that perpetuating the systems that we're trying to dismantle? Like how are we, who are we in struggle with and how are we in struggle with? And maybe it's not for us, honestly, to be in struggle with the cops. Maybe it's for some of the, our white comrades or maybe it's for some of the other folks to be in struggle with them in a certain way. Um, or maybe, you know, and so I think that's what I'm thinking of too, like in the now moment of the first urgency of now and what ways can we push back on cancel culture? Um, and in which ways can we like hold this balance of like, we don't want prisons to exist anymore. So then what is the appropriate response when someone dies? What's the appropriate response when someone kills a black trans woman? Um, I made a Facebook post years ago and I was like, if someone kills me, like I don't want them arrested. I want them to brought, be brought into a process. Um, and like, and of course that just comes from like the increased violence that we see on black trans women. Um, and even at the intersections of like, Black Lives Matter in Minnesota, I talked about this, Ayanna Dior, it was in Minnesota right next to the marches. And as a black trans woman, she was getting beat upon by black folks. And so, um, so then that's mean, can black trans folks struggle with black cis folks? Like who, you know, and, and, I, and I'm interested, I'm interested in struggling with them. And I'm interested in struggling with everyone, funny enough, <laughs> but like, yeah, so, right? I'm like, where, like, who can you struggle with? And like, in this now moment, how do we push back against cancel culture? to create like pod, uh, not pods, little restorative practices um, that are about like kind of experimenting. So if we're not arresting someone, what are we doing? You know, in these moments where folks are getting killed and like, it's really tough to tell people, hey, this, these people maybe these people shouldn't go to jail or maybe, you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that so much. Like I, I uh, in, lately in, in sort of my abolition is thinking I've been, Sitting with um, the work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, who just who defines abolition as moving towards that which is life affirming, right? And so that doesn't mean we have to actually get to that like the end goal, like our prisons. Are, we can be in we can be abolitionists and be in in abolition work as we move towards that which is life affirming. And I really respect that. And I, um, you know, and I think for me when I, I think about this relationship around grace and who am I in struggle with. Um, I think about what is repair, like move at, the, move at the speed of trust is one of those phrases that gets, you know, is shared a lot. Um, and I'm like, I trust, I trust people to be people, right? And what that means is a lot of what you said, Joe, we're going to, we're going to shade each other. We are going to, you know, step on each other's toes. We're going to inadvertently, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, misgender each other. We're going, we're, you know, we're going to do all kinds of things to each other. Um, the question I sit in is what are our processes for repair? Right, like what? Are, what? Are, what are our process? When those things happen, do we know how to stay in relationship? Do we know how to stay there, stay in relationship, and 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 have a way to work it out? Right, like I think that's one of the 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 um, uh, gifts of ultimate roots as a community. And not that, but you know, I know a lot of folks who think, you know, we just go, to, we just go sit in rocking chairs and sing kumbaya because that's all they see on social media. Um, but they don't actually see the business meetings. They don't see what happens. Not, you know, like, but it's this commitment to be in relationship with each other and to, to figure out how both is in when things happen as individuals and also as a community, what is repair? Mm -hmm. What is repair? And you can't have repair if you don't stay in relationship. Right now, you can set boundaries, and I've been really, you know, I mean, folks know, I, I, like I said, I like to keep people's names in my mouth. Um, you know, Princess Hemfield, who's a, who's a wonderful uh, um, somatic practitioner and healer, talked about um, uh, boundaries being the way I can love you and myself simultaneously. Right? 
So I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound like repair means like we're just boom, we're back. Woo! It's all that's all behind us, right? It could mean a whole different relationship. It could mean like we have we have set up a configuration that is different, but we haven't left each other and we haven't given up on each other. We haven't disposed of each other, right? Um, I think that's something that I think I think a lot about. And I don't I. I, you know, don't nobody put in the chat, like, what are some methodologies of repair? I don't know. I'm working on it. Experiment. I'm working on it. Experiment. I'm thinking about Experiment. it. Experiment. Don't ask. We're all, this is an invitation. You know, if you've got some, throw Let's some in the chat. out together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you already know that's going to be asking. So what you do? But like, it's, I mean, that's a valid, I mean, it's a valid question. Even in my local, in the work that I do, like, in Louisiana, like we struggle sometimes, like we're, and it's weird because we believe in like, at, at SOA believe in kinship-based organizing. And I think in the South in general, we believe in kinship-based organizing. So what does it mean when like, you have this really tough moment with the same person who you like eat dinner with or who you live with or who you like see every other weekend, not in the organizing or working or like whatever mm -hmm. structural context and like sustained relationship. I really love when you said these new configurations as someone who struggles with boundaries, which makes me think, which made me think of the like how we were talking about in some of the like now like like fierce and urgent and now like the now portion another thing i'll say is one of the next steps i would love to see is just like black folk like black women black films black trans people like doing the work for the sake of themselves and it not being censored around oh there's a black man who got shot let me run to the front lines being like actually my work isn't at the front line i mean in our work is inherently it has historically let me not even I mean, I get it confused or twisted at all. Our work has historically and inherently been at the front lines of everything. And I'm like, what would it look like for black trans folks and black women and black people in general, black queer folks to be like, actually, the, my main work is not at the front lines. My main work is actually just going to be in community with other black trans folks or to just take care of myself and heal myself. My work is not informed by men or by patriarchy or by saying we have to uplift his name um, without her, her name even being mentioned at all. So I'm like, uh, something about, I don't remember what you said, Sage, but something about what you said was like, I wonder if like in the future, some of the ways that we can reconfigure relationships um, is that we're really centering our wellness and wholeness without it being about going to march for this person. I mean, going to march for a man, which is all okay. I'm not saying don't march. I'm not saying don't protest, but I'm saying, what would it be like if in this new world, we, if we had an experiment where we really, our main work and our main priority was really just taking care and healing ourselves. Um, and some of the other work did manifest too because we were well, because we were whole. You know? <laughs> yeah, because we were well and because we were whole. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I feel that. I feel that. I say. I think I'm just going to voice up something that was just put in the chat. Uh, I think <laughs> maybe then there is no one size fits all for what repair looks like. So I'd like for our last however many minutes we have left, to just riff off of that. So I'll, I'll, I feel like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pull back my last statement, but I, I don't know what repair necessarily looks like, but I do believe in, in a tool for principal struggle. And it's, it's called the Tenets of Principled Struggle. It was developed during the Black Radical Congress in, in 98 um, and uh, uh, often attributed to a woman named Antonia Lee. Uh, um, and it's a set of principles that are, are designed for folks who are in movement relationships, um, but may not necessarily be aligned at the same time, at the same place, and at the same time, right? Like we are, we are all agreeing that we are headed towards Black liberation. We are all agreeing, and in the midst of that, there are so many little interstitial spaces, right, where where we could we could bump up against each other, and rather than bump up against each other and pop off, right? How do we bump up against each other and be in principled struggle together? And it's it's a series of six steps that starts with first seek deeper understanding. Um, one of the steps is, is uh, um, you know, if you have a side conversation, is it something you can bring to the large group, right? Like there, 
so it, it honors both like our need to sometimes be like, yo, homie, man, she's whack. I don't really know, you know, and like we sometimes we need that in order to process to to get to what is the heart of what it is that we are trying to work through collectively. Um, but if you do that and you process that, bring it back to the large group because again, there's the relationship between the individual and the collective that stays in the midst. And so, the the tenets for principle of struggle, you can find them online. You can Google them. Um, but I find that um, uh, um, it is it is is just a methodology that I've used. Uh, uh, particularly, I mean, it's designed for spaces where folks are 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 seemingly, and we need to be careful about this, right? Like sometimes we'll use the same words and think we're you know we mean the same things, and then you know it gets down to figure it out how we're going to move, and it's like oh actually that's not what I meant at all um so how then do we get back in right relation how do we how do we work through it it's actually it's a tool about working through being in principle struggle not just any kind of struggle a principle struggle that says I see you I know we believe in the same things let's figure out how to get there together mm-hmm. I, I don't know I struggle. I struggle with principle struggle the tenets I'm like especially the thing what is like and I maybe I'm misunderstanding them <laughs> but I'm like, I think we need to, I think we maybe we need to have more conversations. Obviously, I need to learn more about them. But when I was first introduced to them, like there's something around like holding your own feelings or like taking care, like consideration of your own actions and then feeling like it's something that only you can hold. That felt really hard for me. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I feel like, but it gives us a good framework, <laughs> I think, to work with. <laughs> I'll, I'll give an example. Like, as long as like, you want to be responsible for your own feelings, right? Like, um, and that doesn't mean it doesn't come back to the group, right? Like I was just in, in a workshop earlier uh, today where my small group had some issues with what was said in the large group. And I was like, okay, so let's go through the tennis or principal struggle. And, and what, we, what we understood is like people were, were uh, uh, heard something uh, in the small group, in the large group. And they were like, oh, that makes me feel like they don't believe in the management of people who are doing alternative leadership and, and that kind of thing. And it's like, okay, so step one is seek deeper understanding. So we came back to the large group and said, this is what I heard. This is what it made me feel like. Tell me, tell me more about what you meant so I can better understand it. Mm. Okay? So you don't throw, you don't, you don't necessarily just, you are, you got to figure it out and just work through it by yourself. It's, it's about how do you, share with the group their impact of what happened and then also stay in it like what does it mean because there there has to be a reckoning you know you can't pretend like people aren't heard or because aren't hurt or heard you know so I think that that to me is one of the the that and that there is another one that's like this may not be the container that you need which is always one I'm like mm, we always feel like this is the container that we need but you know <laughs> yeah, like somebody's listening. Let me tell you. Let me tell you about what I'm thinking. That's literally that's that's where I'd be at. But then yeah, but then I've seen it function so well in so many spaces too. So yeah, I, sometimes I get challenged by them, and then I'm like, okay, well, lean into it. Like, see how it's gonna go, see how it's gonna flow. Yeah, I, I pre- I'm appreciative of the framework, and it gives us something to work with. You know. <laughs> in terms of repair, what do you, or Joe? Were you thinking of anything in terms of the question around repair? No, I literally that was me wanting to know what y'all thought. Yeah, I I'm like, ass, but I can listen to y'all all day. <laughs> glad to be with y'all because I learned from each of you. Um, yeah, very similar. Oh, no, really? I wonder in terms of repair. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I did that because I'm like, am I about to say something that's not okay? I like. Yeah, I think it has to be, right? Because I think of my own practice as being like, <laughs> one that is so unboundaried and it's just so, and I see it across my community, like across my community, like we are going, like we are letting people harm us, like and doing all kinds of things to us. And we're returning to them because we want better for our people or because we want better for ourselves. And we would hope that someone would want better for us. Um, and so I just see a practice uh, both in myself and in my community of, like unboundary like repair and and I think Sage was talking about it very clearly like it's not about like you just be harmed and like well that's that like it's actually about like how can I love my what you said how can you, I love you and myself simultaneously and so for me I go back to what Sage kind of said um and it looks like being okay to like be in the deep end too of like knowing that like <laughs> like this is gonna be like you kind of said earlier too Jeff like this is gonna be kind of gross and ugly 
Um, and it, and honesty. I think the thing to me is like honesty too. Like when I think about repair, I often find ways to just be like okay in the moment for the bigger cause or for the bigger moment. Um, and that that on, that lack of honesty turns into like resentment. Turns into like you know it just turns into this thing where it's like oh like this person always does this to me, but I don't want to be the one to cause trauma or, dr- or drama or anything like that. When it's like actually, you you deserve access to honesty. And so I think being honest, um, for me. And being willing to like, I'm gonna say it again, being willing to experiment with different ways of like supporting each other and being in relationship with each other. Um, they always feel good to me. And I'm definitely someone who's like, oh no, this, it, we can always get where we need to go. Like, yeah, like it's okay. You poisoned everyone at lunchtime. It's okay. Like, we'll figure it out. You didn't like, you know, <laughs> everyone can be restored. That's, that's kind of my, I feel like there's always room. Like no one is not. No one is beyond reach. No one is around. Like, you know, everyone can be restored. And I think um, some folks don't believe that, but I, I truly believe that everyone always has their space for someone to be restored in every situation. And with that core value, you know, that's how I move through it. Well, so much of what we've been talking about, moving into something that's not what we were given, because I feel like so much of the culture, I guess, we've inherited or are forced to live in, not that, right? It's people mess up, they don't get restoration, right? Um, And so I just feel like so much of what we're talking about, this extending grace, this tenets of practical struggle are all the things and mechanisms of us living differently. Again, like, what are the values we're trying to embody? Because Landry's call for embodiment time, I think there, along with that has to be a what are we valuing? What are we wanting to embody? And taking the time to really sit with that and figure that out. Um, yeah, because I believe that we have to value this other way of being. Mm-hmm. Practicing that will take time. It will mess it up. We'll get it right sometimes. We'll mess it up other times. And so, yeah, I'm just sitting, really just thinking about, Joe, what are your values? Do you truly believe people are worthy of being restored? Mm-hmm. Do you truly believe that people deserve grace every time? Not just <laughs> one time, but if they mess up again, You give them grace again. And so I'm just sitting with that and how the self-reflexive informs the collective. And so one of the things that this moment of pandemic, this moment of breakthrough has given us is the opportunity to be self-reflexive so that when we come back into the community, when we come back into the collective, we'll know what our values are and then we can start to shape and form collectively. And so, That's just what I was just sitting here thinking while you all were talking. What is it that we truly value and what is it that we're living into in terms of our values and embodiment of those things? So, yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Joe. uh, um, You know, some of the, some of the most heartbreaking moments of my life is when I have tried my best to live into freedom, mine and everyone else's, right? Like mine and whoever I'm in relationship with, like those have been some of the hardest moments of my life uh, and continue to be, right? Of like, you know, Makani Temba talks about freedom as kind of an individual construct, but justice and liberation are collective, right? So how, what happens when my freedom and your freedom bang up against each other, right? Like what feels like even to you and what feels like freedom to me are rubbing against each other, right? Like those are those are those moments where you're like, okay, what do I go to? Where where do I go? Like how do I how do I hold that? How do I both in, in King's work and in, in Alandra's work, like what does that mean to try to embody and walk through the world with this value of freedom that I believe in? And and not and and think about what that means uh, uh, around what I have to lose. And I say lose meaning what do I have to release? Actually it's a better word. What do I have to release? Uh, and what am I picking up? Right? Like, and I think that is that 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 is the practice, that is a personal practice of freedom. That for me gets us to a, a, a 
helps bring more freedom to the world, right? If I can figure that out. Mm. I love y'all so much. <laughs> I'm mad. I was like, what? Tune in. Tune in. We're like, what's, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> I love you all so much. There's good people who in my life who pass me beverages. Uh, cheers to you all. Cheers to the fierce urgency of now. Ow. Thank you, community, for being here with us, for asking tough questions. Um, it, you know, I really appreciate this panel in particular. It took a lot of courage to come tonight um, and to talk with us and to really delve deep into what it means to heal, to center wellness, to uh, think about the ways in which we work. So I just want to really uh, extend my grace to you all as I find my script so that I, cause y'all know if, if there's family out there, y'all know I can go off script and, uh, <laughs> and I don't want to do that. <laughs> I also want to give gratitude and uh, affirmation uh, to the tech team. We've got Anna out there. Uh, Joe's beholding us down in the live stream. Um, just want to uh, shout out Leela and Judith a bunch of linguists for holding down the interpretation. And thanks really to all of you all for your comments and affirmations and just being there with us as we examine what does it mean for this particular group. Now, everybody, if I had brought in three other people, the whole conversation would have been different, right? But, you know, what does it mean for this particular group uh, to examine the fierce urgency of now. Thank you so much. So tomorrow we have another full day starting with our second uprooting pollination keynote with Camille Schaefer of Azul, one of my favorite people. Um, check out your daily email. We send those out in the crack of the morning at 6 a.m., so that everybody can look at that. Look all the way down because they also go over self-organized spaces. So check your daily email in the morning for details. And we just appreciate you. And we'll see you tomorrow on the live stream. Have a good day. For you. Um, this is a song that my friend Michaela Harrison wrote. And it just keeps running through my body. So I'm going to share it with you. Uh, and I've kind of added my own little part because I like to think, to remember that everybody doesn't have, doesn't use the same patriarchal gender pronouns. So um, I've just incorporated some pronouns that, of people I love. So here you go. I am manifesting protection. There's a force feel all around, keeping me safe and whole. I am manifesting protection. There's a love inside that fortifies my soul. You are manifesting protection. There's a force feel all around, keeping you safe and whole. You are manifesting protection. There's a love inside that fortifies your soul. They are manifesting protection. There's a force feel all around, keeping them safe and whole. They are manifesting protection. There's a love inside that fortifies their soul. Z is manifesting protection. There's a force feel all around, keeping them safe and whole. They are manifesting protection. There's a love inside that fortifies their soul. We are manifesting protection. There's a force feel all around, keeping us safe and whole. 
We are manifesting protection. There's a love inside that fortifies our souls. I am manifesting protection. There's a force field all around keeping me safe and whole. I am manifesting protection. There's a love inside that fortifies my soul.